Hello to all of you unconventional conventionists out there. Welcome to Rocky Talkie, the show where we talk about anything and everything related to Rocky Horror. I'm Aaron. I'm John. And I'm yawning. <laughs> and I'm Nikki. <laughs> Nikki, wake up. I'm awake. For anybody who's listening right now, this is the earliest in which that we have ever, ever recorded Rocky Talkie. It is currently 11.30 a.m. I didn't know there was an 11.30 in the a.m. And it is, uh... <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is the earliest I've ever spoken about Rocky Horror to anybody ever. No fucking kidding. Well, before we talk about Rocky Horror, let's talk about what we did this week. John, what have you been up to? I actually just got back from Philadelphia this weekend because I went to a wedding. Another wedding? Yeah, this is my second wedding in three months. I had a wedding... As y'all recall, Randa and Tyler from the Full Body Cast were wed last month in Orlando, Florida. Congrats. This month, I went to go see my high school friend Chris get married to his partner Melanie of like 9,000 years. Nice. And it was an incredible wedding. They got married at the Masonic Temple in Center City right next to City Hall. And I don't know how they afforded this wedding. Holy hell. <laughs> the Masonic One of those. Temple in Philadelphia is beautiful i walked in and was like who the hell paid for this because i know it wasn't them uh but it was an absolutely beautiful wedding it was really fun to you know it was really fun to see all of my high school college friends together again after you know almost two years of being separated because of covid really nice to see all of them and now i have to get ready for another wedding which is in st louis missouri at the end of october it's like a high school reunion, but only the ones you want to see. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it was a high school reunion of only the people that I wanted to see at the Masonic Temple in Philadelphia. That's pretty awesome. Sounds like a fun time. Nikki, what were you up to this week? Um, I had a really good week. I got to go to the Renaissance Fair with my bestie, Andrea. Ooh. Uh, yeah, we dressed up and we had a good time. We road tripped down. She called you mommy, you know. She called me mommy, yeah. Andrea tried a pickle for the first time. We got to the Ren Fair, and she was just like, yeah, I've never had a pickle. And I was like, how the hell have you lived this long and not come across a pickle? So we got one of those big pickles. We made her try it. She didn't like it. But, you know, <laughs> you live and you learn. <laughs> did you get your big turkey leg? That's that's my Ren so Fair thing. I did not. We thought about it, but... I mean, I'm not a big turkey fan, and Andrea didn't, like, say anything. But we did get baked potatoes, uh, and those were those were baller. I mean, if she can't take a pickle, how's she going to, you know, fit a whole turkey <laughs> in her mouth? You know, I believe that it is too early to be disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I'm, I'm still working off last night's hangover, so I'm still, you know. What would you do last night? I don't remember, actually. It's, ah, uh, shit. It's one of the – no – I have had a fantastic week. Meg's uh, high school friend, Philip has been in town, and we have just been partying it up all weekend long. It's been super awesome. I feel like I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, so I'm not going to spoil too much with that. But no, it's been a great week for me. Work's been super hectic, so I've been busy with that as well. But uh, yeah, no, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I think with that, we're going to move on over to our first segment, uh, Global News. Uh... Woohoo! So from what had gone before, it was certain to be a picnic. Shut up. Once a year, every year, since 2006, Rocky Horror Power Couple Stephanie and David Freeman have hosted the fabulous Rocky Horror Picnic Show. Get it? I get, get it. it. I, I get it. <laughs> it's funny. And after last year's get-together was canceled due to COVID restrictions, the picnic got back on track last Sunday, August 29th at Oakley Court. 150 Brits and international Rocky fans in fabulous Rocky attire got together at Oakley Court. They watched the movie, they took group pictures, they had a ton of fun, but most importantly, they ate picnic foods. Mmm, beans on toast. <laughs> is that a, see, is that a see, British See, you laugh, thing? but beans on toast is fucking delicious. I cannot subscribe to that. I, I just cannot can't. subscribe to you. 
That's yeah. good. That's very good. Please keep your distance. Your tears are way too expensive, Nikki, I gotta say. No, but what sets the picnic apart from other Rocky get-togethers is, sure, it's this little thing. It's about the location. Yeah, it's the castle slash hotel. Wait, the castle's a hotel? It is! Isn't it fun that we get to continue learning new things about our favorite film every day? So yes, obviously the castle is like the draw for the picnic. But that one aside, one of the most fun parts of the picnic is just like how totally freeform the whole experience is. There are a few key scheduled activities. A group photo, a showing of the movie that same night, and a group photo the next morning for those who can roll themselves out of bed early enough. Obviously, me and John would not be attending. Nope. But Steph and David don't rent out a chunk of the rooms at Oakley. They don't have big name guests over, and there aren't offshoot events over the course of the weekend you can go to. From the mouth of Steph, it's very much an anti-convention. We don't really have a structure, per se. So this picnic is absolutely amazing and serves as one of those rare non-con get-togethers for the Rocky community. And it's an absolute blast. Like, just uh, two years ago in 2019, uh, John and I got to experience it when I and a bunch of our friends went to the castle for my wedding. Uh, It was... I don't know, it's just such a great time, and I got to meet people, I got to, you know, eat picnic foods, I got to, like, it was it was just super fun. Uh, we were there, like, the focus for the weekend was obviously on, you know, getting married, that seemed pretty important, but it was the second time, actually, for me, that I got to go to the, the, the picnic, and I loved it the first time, I loved it this, you know, that time. I got to meet people, I got to eat picnic foods, I got to, like, run around on the actual grounds of Oakley Court. That was fucking awesome. Uh, Got to learn that Brad and Janet apparently uh, came from the river uh, the way that the film is shot. So that's an interesting little tidbit. Uh, But it was super cool. There's so many Rocky fans around. You get to talk about like this thing that we all love. And especially because so many of the fans that come out for the picnic are like big stage show fans. It's really neat to get a whole different perspective on the community and on like the wider, like just people who love Rocky that, are maybe not shadow casters like you get at all of the uncons in the U.S. conventions, but they're like huge super fans of the stage show, and I just loved it. It's so much fun. So I didn't actually attend the picnic because I make regular people money and not Aaron money, but we were at Oakley Court that day, and you could really tell the difference in the air as opposed to the other times that we were at the castle. So we had been at the castle like once or twice before the picnic happened. And when we were there, even though the air was kind of full of the fact that Meg and Aaron were getting married at the fucking Rocky Horror Castle, you could tell that the majority of the people at the castle weren't necessarily there because it's a Rocky Horror Castle. They were just there because it's a castle in England that you can stay at, you know. But when we came back after the screening happened, you could tell that the people that were there were there for Rocky Horror. And I'm just going to leave it at that. You can make the decision yourself as to whether or not that is better or worse. Also, fun fact, Riff Raff was in the bathroom. (laughs) When? Uh, In There's a Light, where he's singing. Oh, really? Yeah, that room that he was in is actually one of the bathrooms at Oakley Court. Oh, my God. Yeah, he was taking a big shit while he was watching Brad and Janet. (laughs) Explains a lot. He had to to slide down. (laughs) Otherwise, (laughs) he actually flushed himself down the toilet to get downstairs really quickly. That's efficient amount of travel. I agree. Oh, but it's so true. Like, it, the the days leading up to the picnic are just like, oh, it's a nice British estate, and everybody's here to, like, you know, I don't know, play tennis and, you know, go have a good time. And then the morning of, of the picnic or the night before, like, everybody in blue hair and, you know, crazy costumes start showing up, and they start opening up the banister so that you can go take pictures on it, and, like, it, it turns into a whole different thing. It's super fun. I do have a question about this, though. Mm-hmm. Um, why are we reminiscing on 2019 when we have a brand new, fresh out of the oven picnic to go over? 
Let's get into it. First off, over the pandemic, uh, Oakley Court went through a lot of like refurbishment and updates. So while the outside gardens, the castle facade, and a lot of the word work inside remains obviously largely the same, there were some new color schemes and furniture all around the castle. There have also been a lot of changes to the staff, including a lot of faces familiar to the picnic. Now we have new castle staff to learn about our bullshit and enviously look at us party and picnic once a year. Everyone's been dealing with COVID and lockdowns for like 18 months now, and before the picnic even began, so many people were using the get-together to interact in person. Going up to picnic-goers they knew, and some they didn't, to get into that primo rocky socializing we've all been missing out on. And Meg will be happy to know there were veggies as well as vegan options available this year, but we're told from all the reports that the dessert was the best as it should be. So after the picnic, a big group photo was taken. And let me tell you, this one looks great. Like it, everybody looks like they're having fun. All the photos have been posted to the Time Warp UK site. So far, a total of 556 photos from the day of. That's a lot of photos. Uh, in the group photo, you can see a huge variety of costumes, like the typical stuff, an Eddie in Columbia, Frank in his lab coat, and you know that. But Always with a big twist, right? The Frank in his lab coat has a beard bigger than his face. And there's like a cheerful old man is the concession girl and uh, just all sorts of stuff. Everybody looks like they're having fun. I thought the three dudes on the right really stood out. Like They all have vibes similar to a floor show Frank, but like a little different. All three are dressed in impressive capes, colored red or purple, with massive feathered headdresses. One is in thigh-high-heeled boots, like what you can see on the marquee for kinky boots, and all three looked absolutely fabulous. And best part, one of them even had a child in their arms, and that's truly the best. You know, dressed to the Rocky Nines at the ultimate picnic, and fulfilling dad duty at the same time. Peak Chad hours for this man. So after the food, hotel staff escorted the picnickers to a massive art installation of giant bouncy Stonehenge. What? That's what I said. One of the most unique places to do the time warp, uh, certainly that I can imagine. And everything went smoothly after that, from Rocky viewing that night, to the plain clothes photo the next morning, and then the goodbyes. The souvenir pin given to the attendees of this year's picnic was also super nice. So, traditional, circular pin. It's got the Rocky Horror Picture Show in the double feature font, tracing the top half of it with Oakley Court, Right in the center, a nice blue sky and a little 2021 in green at the bottom of it. It always amuses me. This is this is the shot of Oakley that we all know from the movie, right? The the castle as you expect to see it. It's the back of the castle, right? This is the yep. shot from the river, not from the road. The, this is the shot that Brad and Janet saw walking up. It's not the shot from the road. If Brad and Janet came from the road, you wouldn't have seen this. You wouldn't have seen the castle at all. Fun fact, according to the Time Warp fam site, this picnic was nothing a but net. Everyone involved had a great time, and the attendees had an absolute blast. Next year's picnic has already been announced. That's for Sunday, the 28th of August, 2022, and tickets go on sale, like now, this upcoming Wednesday. That's the 15th. Go get them. If you want to reserve a spot, just contact Oakley Court at 01753-609-988. And quote, Time Warp Picnic 2022. That that's an that doesn't ex that number doesn't exist. Is well, this is this fake? Well, you're gonna have to try it because bookings are only possible over the phone. Road trip, road trip, road trip. You can't take a road trip over the ocean, Nikki. Nikki, you should try it and let me know how it goes. Um, you can road trip to an airport and then get on the plane and then fly to the, the, the freaking British airport or whatever and then rent a car and then drive that car to the castle. That's a road trip. No, trip that's a road trip. You a car to get to that castle. Road <laughs> air trip. You could, that, that, <laughs> Oakley Court is like maybe a 20 pound Uber. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. In their picnic update on their site, the Time Warp fan club thanked all the staff at Oakley Court, as well as everyone who attended and made it special. If you went, we hope you had a great time. You should write in and tell us about it. And if you've never been, you really should check it all out. I know it costs a lot, and I know it's a big, big, you know, kind of expense and like a huge thing. But trust me, just getting to see that castle for that first time, oh my god, it's so fucking cool. 
Next up, still across the pond, we have a new interview with Ore Aduba, the Brad for the England tour of the Rocky Horror Show. Since we covered the opening of the Rocky Horror Show just a few weeks ago, everything other than a few hot dogs has been smooth sailing. And on that streak, we have some good and perhaps rather invasive news from Ore Aduba. So we all know wearing Rocky clothing can be a significant experience. In fact, I'm pretty sure John and I have talked about the transcendental nature of a Frank cape at least twice just on this podcast alone. But imagine if it went one step deeper and your Rocky costume helped you unearth decades old repressed memories. No? Well, that's what happened to Ore. In an exclusive interview with The Mirror, a UK news site, Aduba talked about how his work with the Rocky Horror Show brought back a memory of cross-dressing at a school party when he was just 13. It was at a school Christmas party and his classmates were present, kids all the way from his age up to 18, as well as adult staff. Apparently, he asked his housemaster if it would be all right for him to do a little performance, and his housemaster agreed, having no idea what Ore had in store. Housemaster? Was it like seems, a boarding school? I, I would presume so, because that seems a little kinky for a 13-year-old. Two points to fetish wear. I don't like this joke. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, that's just the dude that's in charge of the dormitory. Like, it's, Yeah, but it's like kind of, it, it's got a fun little ring to it, you know? Maybe it'll be Adam's new nickname. Okay, anyway, his performance was pretty adventurous for a 13-year-old, and doubly so for being brave enough to do it in front of a group of classmates and teachers. So, directly from Ore, when describing it, he says, I decided I would create a one-man show based on me, dressed as Victoria Beckham, and perform her single Out of Your Mind, that's the one featuring Dane Bowers. He says, quote, I was dressed in my sister's platform heels, a tank top, a bandana. It was 1999. I was wearing shades, and I was performing as Victoria Beckham. Dude, this kid must have had balls of titanium alloy. Yo, for real. I'm a whole-ass adult who's been on a Rocky cast for three years, but in certain situations, even I get nervous on stage performing in front of strangers. This dude, at the age of 13, got in front of his whole school and performed a self-rehearsed drag routine. Good for him. We've been getting to learn a lot about Ore on this podcast recently, and like, it's always good stuff. This is just another awesome story to add to the pile. From the same article from The Mirror, we've also learned that bedroom scene with Frank is the most fun part of a show night for Ore, and that things with his wife Portia have never been better as they sit in Antissa... Patient of their second child. <laughs> uh... Thankfully, their first kid, Roman, can't wait either. Ori keeps catching precious moments where he's hugging his mother's baby bump. Oh my god. And Roman always makes sure to say goodnight to the baby. All he's stressed about is whether he'll have a brother or a sister. You go, Roman. You're going to be a great big brother. Okay, adorable babies are cool and everything, but let's not forget the best part of the interview. Can we just talk for a sec about how Ori says that he totally forgotten this school memory and Rocky brought it all back to him? Like, how funny is that? I mean, it, it's kind of awesome. And it, it really speaks to the sometimes, I don't know, unexpected power of being a performer, of putting yourself out there. Our brains are fucking weird places, man. And it's definitely cool when your involvement in performance and the arts is able to, like, unlock something that you'd totally forgotten about. So, I don't know. What about us, guys? Have, have we got any repressed memories that, like, you had brought back to the limelight, that you were uncovered by participating or, like, performing in Rocky? I mean, if we're talking repressed, you know, we've got to be talking Aaron. You have to have something. Well, okay, so it's not exactly a repressed memory, but it's certainly something that came back to maybe bite me in the ass. So after I first started doing Rocky, uh, I started dating this girl and took her back to meet my parents at one point. And inevitably, my mother busted out the photo album. Um, but turns out there are pages in that photo album that I kind of forgot existed, including one 
<clears throat> photo of me that is, uh, I don't know, I was probably seven or eight at the time and was playing dress up. And boy, it's me in this like red flapper dress that I am just having the best time in. And I had completely forgotten that that fucking thing existed. And now my mother threatens me with blackmail with it every time. Every, <laughs> you every single time. literally get on stage in scantily clad women's lingerie and you're worried about a red flapper dress? Let me tell you, I looked fucking good in this dress, though. <laughs> and if you guys want to see it, too, it'll be in our show notes. It absolutely will not be in our show notes. I we'll think. see about that. Hell yeah. <laughs> Meg's going to put it in the show notes. Good luck finding it. So we at Rocky Talkie would like to wish Ore and the rest of the Tory cast the absolute best plus all the happiness and health in the world to Portia and their two little ones. But for now, let's move on to Community News. First up in Community News, if you live in the Midwestern area and have always wanted to participate in a Rocky Horror Shadowcast, hold on to your butts! Flustered Mustard Cast in St. Louis, Missouri recently opened up a casting call, seeking actors in particular to fill the roles of Riff Raff and Krim, plus techies to work with their backstage crew. I'll fill your role. Please don't. Flustered Mustard is a, a bit of a newer cast. They've been performing since June of 2017, and they started the cast out of a true sense of admiration for Rocky Horror History, something close to my heart, as you all know, uh, the people and the movie itself. They're seeking diehard fans who love the movie and are looking to help keep the tradition alive. The cast performs at least once a month, and almost all their shows will be held within a 60-minute drive of St. Louis. Anyone who is interested in submitting an audition should message the cast on Facebook. You need to make sure to include your name, your age, the number of times you've been to a Flustered Mustard show, and, you know, any experience or special talents you might have, and also make sure to throw in there a little blurb about why you think you'd be a great fit for whatever role you want to audition for. Plus, it's totally not necessary, but it would be awesome if you could include a photo of yourself in costume and makeup for the role that you want. Bonus points if you're able to film a video of yourself performing a scene of your character. We super encourage anyone interested to check out Flustered Mustard on social media. They've got a great presence with a lot of photos, and that'll really help you get an idea for the kind of show that they put on. And if you'd like to submit an audition, we've got their Facebook profile linked for you in our show notes. Next up, in the same vein, if you're interested in participating in a Rocky Horror Shadowcast performance but happen to live on the East Coast, the Ordinary Kids, who are located in New Jersey, are currently recruiting members to be part of an upcoming performance. According to their website, The Ordinary Kids is a floor show, which they describe as an all-volunteer performing group that mimics and lip-syncs a film, in this case, it's Rocky. They pride themselves in fostering a climate of purposeful inclusion, an environment where everyone can feel valued and given an opportunity to form meaningful connections. If you're interested in auditioning for a role with The Ordinary Kids, they ask that you submit video auditions on their website in the form of three separate videos a quick intro of yourself, a video of yourself doing the time warp in your best Rocky Horror style costume, and a video of yourself doing a scene playing the character you're auditioning for. For example, if you want to audition for Frank, you probably want to film Sweet Transvestite. The Ordinary Kids are also recruiting tech and run crew members. If you're interested in being considered for their tech team, all you need to do is submit an intro video. You can email your videos into castleadership at ordinarykids2020 at gmail.com. In addition, anyone wishing to be considered as a cast member should fill out an audition form, which can be found on their website. Yeah, I mean, The Ordinary Kids are a fantastic cast. Some of you might remember the absolutely mind-blowing virtual show that they put on, you know, during the Panda Express. It was beyond out of this world. That's the one, I don't know if you guys caught it, actually, I'm sure you must have, that was all green screened, that they, like, shot everybody individually for I know that a bunch of people from FNS participated in it and a bunch of people out of New Jersey as well. Super, super amazing work. Crazy, like, editing, crazy background Photoshop work. Just phenomenal, phenomenal work on those guys' part. Uh, I believe this cast was founded just after lockdown had already started. So this is going to be their first ever journey into, like, live performance. And that's, I mean, that's super exciting. We highly encourage anyone who's 
interested and in the area to check out their website. That's OrdinaryKidsNJ.com. Uh, that'll get you more information about the cast as well as all of the info about the audition process. And with that, I think it brings us to everybody's favorite Nikki flavored segment. That's right. It's time for everyone's favorite Nick, 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 Nack Snack. The tempo just doesn't work. <laughs> what? We're bringing it back, y'all. Nikki. All right. Our first delicious Nack Snack for this evening comes from. Wait, where does it come from? The... This is just an empty page, Aaron. I'm I'm sorry, guys. It's way too early in the morning. I won't lie. I have completely blown off writing this week's Snack Snack. Like I said at the top of the show, I have been out all weekend. Like, I've been having a good time. And, well... Seriously? It's the most important segment. Why can't we get Jacob to work on our snacks? At least he knows how to handle a lady. I don't even know how to unpack that. So, instead... Uh, we're just going to talk about the crazy shit that I did this weekend. What? No, no, no. Uh, follow me. Like, I, I, we've, we've got to turn something around. So, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. For fuck's sake. <laughs> but first, before we get into my awesome weekend, uh, I got to start with my less so awesome work week. All right. Can we? Uh, what is happening? It's, it's so early. No, no. It's okay. M- my work week was... Well, well, it was corporate bullshit, you know, so whatever. Sure. Sure, it was. But but no, first up, I mean, I, I, I want to talk about the thing that I was looking forward to all week. At the end of the work week. Yeah? Just get to it already. Okay, okay. So at the end of last weekend, Meg and I had the pleasure of hanging out with Sam. That's Sam the Hobo to everybody on the internet. They're from JCCP. We got to hang out with them and their partner, Trey. It was fucking awesome. Oh, my God. What? Wish I had been there. Why was I not invited? I want to see Sam the Hobo. It was super awesome to see him last weekend. Like, we went out for drinks and we caught up and got a, you know got to talking as, as some Rocky people do. And uh, we talked a fuck ton about shock treatment, of course. Talked a ton about the Rocky community. Talked a ton about, like, just the differences in shadow casting around the country and how things are in Pittsburgh versus how they are here uh, in New York City. Absolutely awesome. But, of course, my favorite thing anytime that Sam's around is talking about the crazy-ass fan theories. And you guys know some of this. There was the whole fan theory panel that was at the virtual convention. That was super fucking awesome. But I got to sit down and do some deep dives on some of these. Got to get a rehash of Sam's awesome shock treatment American idiot conspiracy theory. That one we're going to have to cover on a future show. It is just way too big to unpack right now. Absolutely love that. Uh, Talk to him a bit about Meg's awesome theory from last week. The Denton is actually in New Jersey theory. I don't know how I feel about that one. I'm still reeling a bit over that. Uh, and I got to talk a bit about my favorite fan theory. Uh, that's the one where I am, it's just complete headcanon for me that uh, the order of events between Rocky and Shock Treatment go uh, Rocky, Shock Treatment, and the judge in Shock Treatment is the same as the criminologist, but all of the stuff that the criminologist is saying in Rocky is actually the judge saying it after shock treatment has happened and he's gotten a chance to like interview and talk to Brad and Janet and gets the whole story and that's chronologically how that works I love that theory I think that's like my by far favorite thing uh what about you guys you guys got a favorite fan theory that you want to you know throw out into the ether um yeah JFK wasn't assassinated his head just did that um Riff Raff was taking a shit while he was singing over at the Frankenstein place. Um, Th- those are both things. Um, but you know, like, it's a movie. Who fucking cares? Am I right? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't really gone deep on the crazy conspiracy theories yet. Y- yeah, you have. Uh-oh. Oh, hey oh. All right, so in addition to talking about absurd fan theories, which we are apparently choosing not to do, uh, we also got to talking about some of the more, like... All right, air quotes, real stuff about Rocky and the community at large. And 
Sam brought up something that uh, has actually been at the forefront of my mind for quite a while now. And I think that it's it's a good thing that we should talk about a little bit. And it's all about accessibility. You know what? That actually does kind of make sense to me. Like, accessibility is a huge part of my jobs, plural. You know, we have to make sure that, like, events at work for students are accessible to each and every student. When we were virtual, we started having to use closed caption systems to make sure that everyone was being able to hear everything. We have to make sure that all of our event spaces are accessible. Uh, same thing with my stream. I have to make sure that my stream is accessible and that closed captions are on my VODs. This is going to be about closed captions, isn't it? Yeah, it's all about captions. Yep. I mean, yeah, I agree a million percent. Even outside of the whole um, like body positive aspect of Rocky Horror, like, you do it doesn't matter who you are. If you have a passion for Rocky Horror... There is absolutely an easy way to make that happen. Be that if you're neurodivergent or physically disabled or mentally disabled, like no matter what you have going on, it doesn't matter once you walk through those theater doors. And I think it's our responsibility as casts to make our spaces as accessible and inclusive as humanly possible. And that's exactly right. That was one of the things that, you know, Sam and I were talking about. And this is super important. So what I want to talk about for a few minutes is subtitles. Sam mentioned exactly how important that subtitles are for the audiences that attend their shows. And it got me thinking a lot about how more shows could really benefit from their inclusion. Now, previously, I didn't really know a ton about the technical side of the movie going experience for those with disabilities. But after talking to Sam, I realized it's not great. Things like subtitles should be much easier for audiences to opt into. And the reality is that the technology that's available in movie theaters, it just lags way behind reality, even more so for basic accessibility features. And you know why this is, you know, accessibility is never really the first consideration for a big global company. Even something as simple as including subtitles in digital broadcasts online is not something that a lot of companies think about. At a certain point they do. I mean, I know it's one of the things that I deal with on a weekly basis with my day job is making sure that, you know, websites and the kinds of projects that I work on are fully accessible for individuals with disabilities, but it's never the first priority and it's always something that you have to put a little extra work into and you have to be vocal about. You have to be out there talking about it and making sure that people who otherwise wouldn't be concerned with this, these things are just aware that there's even an issue. I know that that's one thing that we've been particularly lucky to have dealt with uh, in the New York community because there's an ASL show uh, that we do almost every year, at least before the giant Panera Bread. Yeah, and that's why the ASL show for Rocky is super important. Like Aaron said, they usually put it on once a year, and it's a very different kind of performance. There are considerations for folks who need American Sign Language to communicate. There are subtitles for the movie. There's a translator. There's a bunch of different things that make that specific production wholly successful or wholly accessible. But when it really comes down to it, some theaters can't do shows that project DVDs. Like a lot of theaters have been forced to switch to digital only projection systems, which means that if they are showing a movie, then that movie already has to have the subtitles on it. You know, like it's easy to turn on subtitles on just a DVD player. It's so easy to just pop the DVD in right before everyone comes in, click to turn on the subtitles and then roll the film. But if the distributor is sending the video stream and getting playback status in real time, chances are they're not going to have subtitles on that. And while we're on the subject of digital projection, can we talk about the giant wrench that throws into special events? Like in the past, many casts out there would do things like April Fool's cuts of their films. They would cut in jokes or splice memes into the movie, but now it's just not something that can be as easily done. But in a lot of cities, no matter how cool your floor show is, you wish you could do the crazy edit of the film. But a lot of the time, the theater gets the exact digital file from the distribution company, and that's it. You can't do it. Exactly. And that's the problem we face with a lot of accessibility concerns. You get a file from Fox, you play it, that's it. But okay, let's talk about a few things, and I'll be a little nerdy here for a second. It's totally possible as a consumer to create a DCP file. That's the same kind of file that the distributor sends to your local movie theater. You just need 
a massive pile of technical knowledge and another massive pile of software and about an extra 10 to 20 hours or so to re-encode your video, you know, on top of all that time that you spent editing and exporting your video in the first place. And, you know, even if you do that, the end result, it's not something that the theater may be willing to show or maybe even legally able to show. It depends on their contract with the distributor, and maybe it's tied back to having the actual playtimes and the numbers that are phoned home from the DCP projection. Literally, to get them to play anything, would have to hand a theater employee a hard drive with a file loaded on it, and then ask them to put it on their theater server. That could be a liability issue. I mean, it's not any crazier than asking someone to splice something into the film 25 years ago. But I mean, it's it's pretty much that same level of crazy. Exactly. It's that crazy. They can get in trouble. You can get in trouble. All of the above. And that's dumb, especially if you're trying to just do some weird event, let alone if you're doing something relevant or something that should already be an option, like actually strictly improve the Rocky experience with an accessibility win by just adding subtitles. Right. I mean, it's. So surprising that the distribution companies tied their theatrical broadcast format to draconian anti-piracy measures. Because if you are going to design a high-resolution, amazing digital format, it should be able to detect if you download a car. You wouldn't download a car, would you? Regardless, and setting aside all this techno babble about digital formats, the true point is that more theaters should be trying to be more inclusive especially about things that should be as easy as shit at this point, like subtitles. We as a community should be more vocal about asking Fox to provide, you know, accessible DCP prints with subtitles. It's not that fucking hard. Is it? We asked for superheroes 20 years ago and we got that. A more inclusive print wouldn't be that hard, especially because it's digital. I mean, it's probably that hard for the bottom line, and that's why it's not an option for the new release films let alone Rocky, but at least we can ask. Yeah, I mean, getting a big conglomerate to do anything can be super frustrating, let alone getting our voices heard. But a million percent, this was one of the best things to talk to Sam about. And like, I, one of the things that I love talking about people, especially who've been around the community for a while, is being reminded that even when people have been in the community for so long, there's always new perspectives. There's always new things that come up. And there's always a changing sense of what's important and what kinds of things we should be looking at as a community. And especially even now, being able to see that there are still ways and there's still things that we can strive for as a community to make Rocky a more inclusive and just a better space for everyone. So, you know, with that talked about, don't you guys want to know about the rest of my weekend? Not really. Boy, oh boy, do I ever. Thank you, Nikki. Ugh. Okay, come on. Keep going. All right, so this just last weekend was fucking awesome. So I did more random going out. I did more dancing. I did more drinking. Like, I just had a great time. Like, more so than I have had a chance to have in, like, a good goddamn while. And it was absolutely amazing. And it relates to Rocky because... It all relates to Rocky. He doesn't have a moment that isn't about Rocky. What? You heard me. Well, you're not wrong. So I went out downtown in Manhattan with Meg and her best friend, and we ended up at Marie's Crisis. Uh, John, you've probably been here before. I have, yeah. Yeah, super fun place. Like, it's a, for those of you who don't know, it's a uh, piano bar that's strictly show tunes that's down in the village. Uh, and it is like this tiny little cramped space. They're cash only, so don't try any of that funny credit card business there. Uh, and it's just all night long, people jammed in a room, singing show tunes with an awesome piano player. Super cool, but a super big reminder that I am not the biggest nerd in the universe. <laughs> Uh, some of these people were singing songs that I have never even heard of from shows that I didn't even know existed. Did you know that there was a Carrie musical? Yes. yes and it's incredible. It's wonderful. I had absolutely no idea. Uh, oh and it was, God. it was super cool to see everybody there, everyone enjoying their own special thing. And like, just super cool to see the world, you know, getting back to normal a little bit. Yeah. I love piano bars. I think they're all really fun. Marie's Crisis is, especially if you are, you know, in the Rocky scene, is probably a go-to considering, like Aaron said, it is like only show tunes. 
But that also assumes the fact that you like being around theater people. Uh, if you don't like being around theater people, then I don't recommend going to Maurice Crisis because that is the only clientele that they serve there. You know, we totally had this moment where we were there and we're looking around go, and I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm going, Meg, I swear to God, I've, I've met these people before. I've seen some of these people here before. And she turns to me and it's straight out of a Rocky Khan playbook. And she's just like, that's because we all look the same. It's all the same. We are all the same people. <laughs> And you, I totally get that. I've got a lot of opinions on piano bars, specifically Maurice's crisis, but this is Aaron's story. And then, and then, and then. Okay, okay, it gets to Rocky. I promise. So after we were over at Maurice's crisis, we went across the street to Monster. And downstairs at Monster, it's a club that's also in the village, uh, there is a little stage and, like, there's often a lot of drag performances there. Super cool. was a lot of fun to see. But we walk in and what's the first thing that happens? There's a queen on stage. Their name is Cherry Poppins, which I absolutely love that. Hilarious. Uh, but the music starts and I go, wait a minute, I know what this is. Their whole routine started with, like, a good 45 seconds of the Belinda Sinclair disco version of Tatcha. <laughs> so, yeah, can't escape Rocky even when I'm going out for a night on the town. But, funny story, just across the street from Monster is a place called Duplex, another club that's in the you know what we're just gonna keep going and it, it duplex has been around for quite a damn long time like a very very long while so long that i can actually throw this all the way back to a fun story from 1978 that's as early as the community goes back i mean almost so this is a throwback to the first two fan conventions the very first thrown by john mandrachia right okay so follow me here at duplex so right after the second ever convention that's the very week after the second convention uh if you're keeping track on a calendar at home that's tuesday and wednesday october 10th and 11th 1978 uh jonathan adams that's dr scott or the narrator from the original show performed his one-man show at the duplex cabaret theater in greenwich village oh my god i wish i'd seen that i always figured he was like the funniest guy in the room, you know? But other than, I mean, aside from that, aside from that, he was certainly the guy who embraced the Rocky community the most in the early days. He was the original narrator in the stage show. Other than Tim Curry, he was the most experienced man in the room. Unfortunately, that same week that he was performing at Duplex, uh, Jonathan Adams' performance happened to line up to the exact same couple of nights that Tim Curry was doing a concert in Manhattan. Oh, no. So how did this happen? There are a couple different accounts of how the connections were made and how Jonathan Adams got this gig. Super cool story. Ooh, drama. Uh, not really. Uh, but, but here's the version that uh, seems the most consistent in its narrative. When Jonathan Adams was booked for the convention, that's the second convention in Long Island, he talked about doing his cabaret act in the city somewhere. Accordingly, he was directed to Sal Piro, and Sal connected Jonathan Adams with Duplex in the village. See, Sal had been performing his own stand-up act in the village for a while. A comedian in his own right, Sal had done a lot of shows all over New York's village. The very earliest of the Transylvanian fanzine talks about how entertaining Sal's comedy was at Duplex and other venues. And as such, Sal had the connections of Duplex, and it made perfect sense for him to do some networking for Jonathan Adams. And this is how the story is told in both Creatures of the Night, that's Sal's book, and also in the first Transylvania National issue number one. For those of you following along, that's the white and black cover dated February 1979. But in the very first national issue of the Transylvanian, you actually get a feel for how awesome of an entertainer Jonathan Adams was. And this surprised me. I had always seen Dr. Scott as boring and, you know, the whole Nazi thing a little off-putting. <laughs> but knowing he was the first narrator in the stage show and the fact that his stand-up embodied, like, the 60s beatnik aesthetic is actually pretty damn neat. 
Yeah, so here's some actually insane things to realize about this duplex show that he did. It was put on the same weekend as the second Rocky Horror Convention. That's like at the dawn of the whole Rocky phenomenon. And these first conventions were produced by Paul Spiegel and John Mandraccia. Yeah. And we're talking about Jonathan Adams. Yeah. Who do you think put up the funds to promote Jonathan Adams at Duplex? Oh my god, a fucking course. Right, it all comes back together. It's discussed in the early issues of the Transylvanian. So Sal may have made the introductions, but it was Spiegel and Mandraccia, the same two guys behind the convention, and that had brought Jonathan Adams and the rest of the cast to the States. On top of doing all of that, they also funded this event at Duplex. That same weekend, Tim was singing. Uh, apparently it was a sight to be seen. Well, don't leave us hanging. You best be able to recount something from that night. Yeah, there's there's a great write-up of this in one of the early Transylvanians. Uh, Sal opened for Jonathan that night. He did his whole routine. Um, and then Jonathan came on, and his cabaret act, his like performance that he did, is a bunch of original songs uh, and some readings of like some poetry and some other original stuff that was written by him. One of his, like, signature pieces that he used to do was Ba Ba Black Sheep. You know, Ba Ba Black Sheep. But he performed it in the style of four different composers. Like, this is so, like, ahead of its time. You see this kind of shit on YouTube now, right? Like, oh, I'm going to do, like, this song in the style of nine different things. He was doing this in a cabaret act in the late 70s. He also had some other weirder bits that he did. Uh, he put on mod glasses and, like, a cleric's collar to do this bit that he called Rock and Roll Vicar, which I think just sounds fucking hilarious. I guess he just had to be there. I hope so. It's one of those things that, like, I really hope that a video surfaces someday of this stuff. Maybe not this performance in particular, but just Jonathan Adams' cabaret act in general. Like, I'm super curious to check it out. I know tons of other people would love to. If anyone out there knows about it or has some, some video to hook us up with, please, please, please toss it our direction. We'll make sure to hook everybody up. And that was my weekend. And also, that's our show. I personally want to thank Sam the Hobo for a wonderful evening of Rocky Conspiracy Theories and Cherry Poppins for a super fun, weird night of Rocky-filled drag. If anyone has a question they'd like us to answer on air for Nikki Asks a Question or some community news they'd like us to talk about or even just a cool story to share with the community, we'd love to include it in our show. Just go to our website, rockytalkypodcast.com and fill out our contact form to tell us about it. And if you're enjoying Rocky Talkie, please help us out by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to the show. It makes the podcast more accessible to new listeners, which really helps us grow my dick. What? What? The show. And if you want even more Rocky Talkie content, check us out on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, all at Rocky Talkie Podcast. We'll talk to you all next week. Bye! Um, why are we reminiscing on 2019 when we have a brand new, fresh out of the oven picnic to go over? Let's get into it. Because nobody went this year. I don't... So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my armpit itched. Okay, anyway, his performance was pretty adventurous for a 14 year old. I thought, I thought he was, he was 13. 13. <laughs> His performance was pretty adventurous for a 13-year-old. Every time we mention his age, it just becomes different. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of like that. Okay, anyway. His performance was pretty adventurous. What does that you wouldn't, mean? You wouldn't download a car, would you? It's a, no. It's a 90s throwback to the anti-piracy yeah. ads. You wouldn't download a car. I mean, I might a download car. a car. What kind of car are we talking about? One with like four wheels, I'd say. I wouldn't download a Kia. <laughs> Sponsored by Ford. Is it bedtime? Yeah. Yep. Okay, good night.